Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Donald Trump is shook. With less than 90 days to go before the election, the race has taken a turn he clearly did not see coming. Last month, after the Republican National Convention, remember that? Just a few weeks ago? He was jubilant. I mean, Trump and his campaign clearly told every reporter they could, on and off the record, that they were going to coast to victory, that it was in the bag. In fact, Trump was already measuring the drapes in the Oval Office. Staffers were scrambling to call dibs on jobs in the administration. But of course, then, well, things changed. President Joe Biden did what few people thought possible, something remarkable and honorable, and decided to step aside from the race. The Democratic Party almost immediately coalesced around Vice President Kamala Harris as his replacement. The process to get to that point was wrenching, excruciating, and difficult, but it has very obviously transformed the race in a whole bunch of different ways. The Democratic campaign, with Kamala Harris rising to the top of the ticket, took in a record-breaking $310 million fundraising haul in July. Donald Trump raised less than half that amount over the same time period. The enthusiasm for the vice president has been palpable in the enormous crowds as she is growing in rally after rally after rally and in the polling. A recent survey found that nearly half of all voters say that Harris becoming the nominee makes them more motivated to go to the polls. And there's been a definite shift in the numbers in the head-to-head -head polling. Harris now leads in the polling average nationally by more than two points. Joe Biden was down by more than three points before he dropped out. That's a five-point swing, just doing the math in my head. And five-point swings in an electorate this polarized are an enormous deal. The dynamics of this election have also been fully recast. With President Biden no longer running, Donald Trump is now the only elderly man in the race. He would be the oldest president ever inaugurated if he wins in November. He would have the nuclear codes at the age of 82. With the focus shifted away from Biden, it is easier to see that underneath the fake tan and the strange hairdo is a 78-year-old man, a man well past retirement age, seeking the most demanding and stressful job in the world. Don't forget, running for president, just running for the job, is about as exhausting an endeavor as you will find. I mean, at least normally the way it's done. And Donald Trump really does seem to be feeling it, which, no shade, I think I would be too if I were him. I mean, this week, he is doing exactly one, one campaign event in the solid red safe state of Montana. Meanwhile, he's dumped the usual grueling travel schedule on his 40-year-old running mate, following Kamala Harris and Tim Walls all over the country in what the nation just dubbed a stalker tour. Today, Trump's sole public activity, the only thing he did publicly to campaign for president, did take him quite far, all the way down the hall of Mar-a-Lago to hold a press conference in front of a select group of reporters. The typically rambling, hour-long event took place in the dark and cavernous main living room with Trump flanked by an ornate piano and two candelabras. The vibe a mix of Liberace and Vampire. Looking really worn down and spent and exhausted and like a man who is just not having any fun, the former president floundered from one absurdity to the next. We have a lot of bad things coming up, and we're very close to a world war. In my opinion, we're very close to a world war. We, we were given Joe Biden, and now we're given somebody else. Heavy into the transgender world, heavy into lots of different worlds. You have people dying financially because they can't buy bacon. Everybody's going to be forced to buy an electric car, which they're not going to do because they don't want that. We have commercials that are at a level I don't think that anybody's ever done before. Nobody's spoken to crowds bigger than me. If you look at Martin Luther King, when he uh, did his speech, his great speech, and you look at ours, same real estate, same everything, same number of people. If not, we had more. President Xi of China and I were very good friends. We met right here, right in that, except we had a beautiful sofa there. It's a hard room because it's very big, if you know. So this is worth $18 million. I know Willie Brown very well. In fact, I went down in a helicopter with him. We thought maybe this is the end. Trump was right about everything. I have been right about a lot. Uh, not right about going down in a helicopter with ex-San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown, something that had it happened, we would know about. Willie Brown, of course, saying today that, of course, never happened. Uh, 
doesn't seem like it's likely the case that the Jan 6 crowd that assembles that Trump could hurl them violently at the Capitol to overthrow the American Constitutional Republic was as large as the famous March on Washington at which Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech. Trump also seems to have resigned himself to the fact that he will have to face off against Harris in front of the cameras, telling reporters he wants to appear now at three debates, including the one he'd already negotiated with Biden, although he got the order wrong and the network one, and he wants to do a Fox one. But that was the one he tried to pull out of when Harris was at the top of the ticket. So then the vice president responded from the tarmac in Detroit before taking off for her next campaign stop in Phoenix. Well, I'm glad that he's finally agreed to a debate on September 10th. I'm looking forward to it and um, hope he shows up. Are you open to more debate? I am happy to have that conversation about an additional debate for after September 10th, for sure. Despite his claims today that he's looking forward to debating Kamala Harris, Trump still appears to be more than a little bit obsessed with his former opponent. He's been uh, posting over his website, like, desperate strange fan fiction about, quote, a big movement to bring back Crooked Joe. And there's, like, lots of folks in his orbit who are trying to will this to happen as if they can, like, pull off some Jedi mind trick and get Biden back on the ballot. Trump is really just underscoring the fact that he and his campaign, despite constantly saying that Biden was going to drop out, that, that he was going to be replaced the last minute, this is the thing they said all the time, somehow ended up woefully unprepared for that exact eventuality and not prepared to run against Kamala Harris. And nearly three weeks in, they still don't appear to have figured out how to do this, how to adjust their strategy. Because we are in a very different world, one where Donald Trump is no longer the clear favorite. It's a real race. He might lose it. And we all know Trump just cannot handle losing. He almost brought down the American experiment because of it. And that is why we have seen him swing wildly from overconfident to spiraling, whining, and very obviously miserable. Meredith McGraw is a national political correspondent for Politico and author of Trump in Exile. Jamel Bowie is an opinion columnist for the New York Times, where he wrote this week about Trump's birther bag of tricks. They join me now. Jamel, I guess I'll, I'll start with you about that. Um, I don't know what you call it today. I mean, at one level, uh, you know, the word news has new in it for a reason. And part of the reason I think that Trump doesn't make news for how strange these appearances are is because his, most of his appearances through his political career have been quite strange. But it does really seem to me that he is, brains seem more scrambled. He has a harder time keeping a thought. And he also seems like he's not having fun. I think all of that's correct. He, with Biden out of the race, it's so clear how much more diminished he is compared to 2020 and certainly to 2016. And I think this press conference made that clear. His, his appearance at the National Association of Black Journalists Conference makes that clear. Every time he has one of these extended appearances, it becomes all the more clear that this is simply not the same guy of uh, four, eight years ago. And the guy of four, eight years ago wasn't particularly coherent then. Um, and I think you're right to key into the fact that he appears to not be having any fun whatsoever. And I think it's an important part of his appeal in 2016 and 2020 was a sense that like Trump was having fun. This was sort of like an enjoyable, fun, celebratory thing. And the extent to which this is really dour campaign from Trump so far between him. Even Vance's appearances are these very kind of terse events. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's meaning. Uh, Meredith, you do have a book out about Trump in exile, which is partly about his time down in Mar-a-Lago. And it was sort of, there was something kind of, darkly comedic to me about the fact that, you know, people are noting the fact that J.D. Vance is flying all over the country. Harrison Walls are doing all these events. Trump has one event. So he's like, fine, I'll do an event. Come down to Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> that's where I'll do the event, which, again, like I said, no shade. If I were 78, that's how I would want to script it, too. But how do you understand the strange lack of events, which isn't just this week, but actually, if you count up the numbers, like he just has not been on the road. Well, he was asked about that today at the press conference, and he scoffed at it, pushed back at the question. But the press conference we saw today, this was classic Trump in so many ways. Look, he was trying to contrast himself with Vice President Kamala Harris, who's received some criticism about not doing any interviews or press conferences herself. But really, this is about him trying to take the spotlight off of the momentum that uh, the Harris-Walls campaign has had since Walls uh, was announced and since Harris 
Harris took the top of the ticket, inviting uh, reporters down there to pepper him with questions, showing off Mar-a-Lago, but really going all over the map in terms of his answers to questions in a way to uh, try to uh, defend himself and to try to uh, turn the media's attention away from the real uh, momentum that we have seen just in this past week. This, this is, let me stay with you on this, because I do think Maggie Haberman made this observation, too. She was down there today, just like, he doesn't like when the attention's not on him. And there was all these people who were saying when, when, when during those, those brutal three weeks of the Democratic Party after the Biden debate, leading to his withdrawal from the race, people were saying, well, Trump is being so savvy. He's laying low. But he wasn't actually laying low. Like, if he went to Truth Social, he absolutely was not laying low. It's just that the attention wasn't on him. He seems to think more attention on him, the better. Do you, do you think that's the, the fundamental thesis that he has about the campaign? Well, for Donald Trump, it's always so important to have attention, good or bad. And, you know, if you think just three weeks ago where the Republican Party was, Donald Trump just you know, got the nomination um, in Milwaukee. There were balloons flying, smiles. The Republican Party was simply uh, confident and gleeful at the idea of going up against President Biden in November. And so much has changed in a short matter of time. And the Trump campaign has tried to argue that the fundamentals of the race haven't changed here. But you saw in the press conference today when Trump was asked about poll numbers, he acknowledged that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is getting a lot of attention and support from black women. And it was sort of a, a tacit acknowledgement of the state of the polling and the new state of the race now that Harris and Walls are on the ticket.